All right. Adam, do you want to do the intro? Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, doing good. How you doing? Very well. Anything yeah. new with you? No, I'm excited to be back on the podcast. Not for long if you keep up that attitude. <laughs> How's your training going? Good, good. Just uh, got back from a deload. Came back from family camp, which was pretty boring. So yeah, now I've got week one of a five week peak into states. So yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah. yeah. How about you? How's your training going? Very interesting. So I actually just got a new coach. Whoa. I know. Good Ashton deal. Riddell finally decided that his uh, it's time for a coach. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Leo from Course Manga. The light bulb is falling currently. Getting coached by Leo from Corpse Magna, which is his company. Corpse Magna? Corpse Magna. Magna. Hang on. I don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> is this Corpse, like, manga? I don't know. I don't know. What is it? Because your pronunciation sometimes is very off. Of course it is, bro. I can't even remember basic terms. Corpse Magna. Yeah. Mr. Leo, first 10 times bodyweight total in Australia. It was actually interesting enough, last weekend... Um, I flew out to a competition in Adelaide and just to help out with an APU comp, um, ended up doing a lot of the weigh-ins, uh, gear check, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, competing there was Leo. Leo and I have been friends for a little bit. I first had like officially met him in a Commonwealth when we went, I uh, went out to lunch with him and that was really fun. Him and I reconnected cause he competed to qualify, you know, climb the ranks of APU pretty much. And... Um, over cigars and whiskey, we got into a very... Did you have a glass of whiskey? Yeah. How was it? It was alright. It was alright? I actually, to be honest, I hopefully you're not watching Leo, because Leo <laughs> bought me the whiskey. Hmm. Uh, I was pretty shit. Oh, it was a yeah. bad whiskey? <laughs> it was a bad whiskey, man. <laughs> I got a Leo, I got a... Because Leo goes, he's like, hey, uh, do you want a whiskey? Or like, like what, what's your preferred drink? I'm like, oh, I don't drink. He's like, surely have something. I'll, I'll get you a whiskey. It pairs well. I went, mm. okay, give me a whiskey. And so I'm, I'm smelling. I'm like, what is it? And he goes, whiskey. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but like, what is it? And he goes, scotch. Uh, okay. And I went, I'm in for a fucking ride. Yeah. And so I drink are. it. It just like, it's like, <laughs> yeah. just fucking, <laughs> just comes straight at you. It was, yeah. it wasn't smoky. It was just like whiskey. It was just hard. It was hard. Yeah. Like Nat would have gone like ill, because when we went out the other um, the other night and Nat Matt bought a whiskey, that was strong. It was smooth and smoky. Yeah. This was like five times strong. It was just some whiskey yeah, in the middle of an for, ad- Especially for someone who doesn't drink. Yeah, to yeah. Go, to go into that, that's pretty rough. It was like I can handle the flavor, but it was just like oh, uppercut. Mm. Um, so the whiskey itself wasn't amazing, but him and I we shared a a whiskey and some cigars and. I poked his brains about training because I was like, this would be fun. And it's rare when someone competes the day of at 1.30 at night, gets into a very deep conversation about powerlifting principles with a vi- like super articulate, super detailed. N- not many people have that in them, that passion. And even the knowledge base to be able to produce any thoughts under those conditions, like he would have been wrecked. Hmm. And, and I said to him like that now, I was like, we should go up box together. And he's like, cause he was like super, <laughs> he was like super excited. Like, you know, internal rotation bullshit, you know, like, blah, 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 like going on. And then I'm like, we should do a couple blocks. He goes, yeah, we should do a couple blocks. I'm yeah, like, would you be keen? He's like, yeah. And it was just <laughs> such a funny, like funny experience. Hmm. And so I've been on a, I've been on his training for a week. First time ever squatting three times a week in a training cycle for myself, which is new. Um, and I'm just excited. I'm excited to see where it is because the one thing I've realized is like, it's important that I challenge my beliefs. It's important that I challenge my limiting beliefs, especially. And to always discover the new perspectives on the same ideas, even, you know, just trying to expand my overall, overall knowledge base yeah. and be held accountable in many other ways. So... I'm very excited, Mr. Leo, if you're watching this. It's going to be an exciting one. Yeah, and it's great for you to have someone who's got that level of experience competing at such a high level. Like, he's one of, if not the best in Australia by any measure. And he's been to Worlds. And he coaches elite athletes. So, he's got a wealth of experience. And that that in of itself is enough reason to go with him. So, yeah. 
Absolutely. Should be, should be very interesting to see how you go. It is going to be very interesting. So, but yeah, to answer your question, my training has been going great. Yeah. Yeah. So life's good at the moment. Very and, cool. And uh, speaking of life being good, let's touch on some exciting athlete highlights of the week from some of our boys. Alrighty. Let's... Okay. <laughs> we have, first up, Jimmy again. Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah. My God. Right now, we are currently watching Jimmy squat 220 for three. Very strong pop off his back. That's been a problem in the past. I think he's certainly getting hyped up. And look at that. He goes down and comes back up. <laughs> I think he's going to do it yeah. two more times. Yeah, good depth from Jimmy as well. Oh, yeah. He usually cuts it way more than that. Yeah, we were talking about his depth last he's week. It. Wow. Two twi- so, that is the first time he's ever touched five plates. I can see your reaction. You're like, holy shit. Okay, maybe he is stronger than me right now. Yeah. If we play it, are we going to play it on the screen with audio? Cause oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bro. Let's... Uh... Yeah, just because he sounds like a hydraulic press. <laughs> sounds like it's hydraulic insane. press noises from Mr. Budu it Jimmy. Got, it got louder with every rep. Well. <laughs> like I could see... The reason why I was laughing at the end is because I could see people from the other side of the room like turning up from what they're doing. They're like, what the hell is going on? It was too funny. But yeah, great set overall. Yeah, yeah. it was insane. The fact that if first time he touched five fucking... Five plates and he made it look like that. And one, it's just, it's phenomenal. It's funny, the heavier his strength gets, the better his form's getting. It's just, we have to highlight such an amazing lift from Jimmy. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how this translates to his his top end come comp time because we've never really seen what triples do to his top end, have we? We have never. Yeah. Yeah, so I picked him up about eight weeks out from a state qualifier, or ten weeks out, and so we really didn't have time to refine everything and perfect it. Um, and so coming into this comp, we've had a very long prep time, very long actually. And so for him and I to, we're pretty much going to see like, what's his top end look like? Does his form hold? Are are these, are these improvements really going to demonstrate? What does his strength curves look like coming off high volume and then into sort of an intensification phase and now into a peak? What does his strength curves look like? Who knows? Right. Yeah. I can't say I know, which is exciting. Right. Dreamer, let's who knows. He might have a, the the best dreamer peak in the world, and he squats two fifty, week uh, week three or week four, and he squats two sixty in comp. Like who fucking knows? Yeah, I think it's a highly individual thing. Like me personally, if I can hit a triple, I know I've got minimum fifteen, and most times twenty kilos more. If I can hit a triple at a ten, that I've got fifteen to twenty keys left personally, but. It's not like that for everyone. We can use one rep, one rep Mac calculators, but they don't really tell us much. Mm. Like they can be highly inaccurate, especially with higher reps as well. And then you start, like, it's harder to gauge RPE at those higher rep ranges. And then if it, like, if you go from an, a set of six from an RPE seven to an eight, like that drastically changes your max and you don't mm. actually have a good indication. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much Jimmy gets out of it. Usually with someone who grinds, a lot who hits these super big RPE 10 sets, which all of them look like the same speed. <laughs> <laughs> we um, don't know what the RPE is. Maybe it was an eight, yeah. maybe it was a nine. I mean, your guess is nine. Oh, for this set? No, this is a 10, bro. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who was there while he was doing it, it looked like a 10. Okay. It was, it was like, that's a 10. On, on like, video, you, I go, oh, because yeah. if, I, if I extrapolate my own velocities, that would be a three rep in reserve set. Yeah. Yeah. De- genuinely. But Jimmy, you know, with the amount of exertion he put into that set, that was definitely a 10. Yeah. So we'll see We'll see what his top end looks like. I'd say he probably is like 235 mm. like, on that day. Um, so yeah, we'll see, see how that goes. Yeah. And one thing I thought was really interesting, actually, you were talking about predicting, or like RPE, is it necessarily accurate at high rep sets? Well, potentially if we use the actual person's rating of perceived exertion, it might not be. One thing I've been really thinking about recently is using velocity-based training to actually calibrate the reps in reserve. So let's say you do a, an AMRAP on a bench press. It was a five rep max. The first rep velocity is five RIR. Fourth, second rep is four. And then what we do is we get this continuum on the actual velocity, right? And what we could do is we can then do, let's say we could find later in, in a block or in a different meso or in the same week what a three RM looks like. 
and then we could see if there's the same rep velocity drop off or rep velocity one RAR has the same velocity on a three RM or a five RM, what we can do is we can take this data and we can velocity track lifts. Someone could report it as a seven, but the velocity says, mate, this is a, this is like literally four reps in reserve. So that's a bit of a side tangent on something I've been thinking about is using velocity based training to really predict these things. Cause yeah. Leo actually talking about Leo, he was, uh, he's very big on velocity based training. He's a very data driven coach. And him and I were talking about this over, over a random Adelaide pub. <laughs> so, very exciting stuff. Who knows? I might end up doing some velocity-based training, and I'm sure... Yeah. Do you want to we... buy a $500 velocity tracker? Sure, just might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll buy an Alico bar where it's integrated inside it. Go Oof. the next step. Yeah, pay for shipping from Sweden. That'll be fun. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting you talk about velocities because a lot of the times, like, we see a rep can move really fast we're like, oh, he's got 20 kilos left easily. Hmm. And then they go up 10 and it's like, whoa, what just happened? It slowed down like crazy. And a lot of the times we see that when someone's very elastic or they use a lot of, uh, like talking about the squat mm -hmm. specifically, they use a lot of elastic energy out of the hole. And what happens is either their technique isn't stable at higher weights and they try to use that same bounce and they just lose position and miss it. And other times it's just, they're a speed-based lifter, like I know with Taj, um, if his deadlift doesn't move fast, like you better not go up. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it's right. Not be there. And it takes a lot of discipline to recognize that as a lifter, because Taj specifically, he'll feel like he has twenty kilos more, ten kilos more, but you add like five, and he can fail it. And so, well, not five. That's an exaggeration. He he could add that ten kilos and completely fail it. For him, yeah, velocity-based lifters, you've got to really hold yourself accountable. It can feel fast. It can feel good. It's like, man, you've got to ring that shit back. Yeah. And a lot of the times, if that's happening to you, it's an indicator that something's not right. If you're moving lightweight fast, you should be able to, like, on paper, you should be able to do more. So that should be an indicator to you, like, is my technique messing up at these high loads or I need some more practice at these high percentages mm. or do I need to just readdress whether this rep range is actually effective for me in converting to that one RM? Yeah, maybe the, that's a good point. Is the technique stable at top end or do you need more top end? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the interesting case is, okay, let's fix both of those and see what happens. Then are they, are they really velocity based lifters? I think maybe, maybe they are, maybe they're not. Yeah. And a lot of the times you don't want to do both at the same time because then that's just poor scientific method. You don't want to change too many variables at once. Just introduce things, just slowly put it in, see what happens. No, nah, man. Flip that <laughs> shit upside down, bro. Yeah. Dye my hair red. Just change block, <laughs> ch change everything, every block. I just mean... start giving them power cleans just for no reason. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Speaking of which, I did see a video of Ash Ashton Ruska do like a five by three with power cleans. It's so interesting. I love mm. watching his stories. He's yeah. like, he seems so non-specific unless it's comp prep. You know what I mean? Like he's always oh, lifting maybe. super sub max, non-specific. At least the quick clips I see on his Instagram story. Yeah, I think the reason he lifts so sub maximal is just how strong of a person he is. Like an RP8 single for him is going to produce way more fatigue than it would for someone half his size. Like he's 105 kilos and he squats 380. Like, could you imagine doing a single at 700 pounds and then you got back downs at like 300 kilos like that's just way too much it's just objectively fatiguing yeah not even at a subjective level and i even saw a story from his coach um marcellus talking about how they deliberately do a lot of sub maximal work in that higher rep range in the blocks preceding um their comp prep which is something that he almost never does or never never preaches for anyone else it's mm. just because of how strong ashton is that he needs that low end to actually like make consistent training so he doesn't get banged up wow yeah very interesting yeah so that's where individualization is important absolutely speaking of weird individuals our next highlight <laughs> young will deadlift specialist certified gangster certified mm, sumo doesn't count we have mr will mr will doing a pretty gnarly two and a half kilo pr 290 kilos on the bar he weighs roughly 76 kilos right now I really like that he's starting to really take his time more and set his hook. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Stands up. Ooh, so that is crazy. Firstly, mm. whether that was perfect form or not, that was fucking crazy. Like that was insane. Yeah. 
my first reaction when I saw that was, holy shit, did I program 290? <laughs> did you? And I don't know if I did. I don't know if I did. I think I programmed the single a little heavier because you was going on deload. Heavier? Yeah. Yeah. I'll show you. We'll work out the program. Because what I was running was a single, and then we go three by seven, and I wanted to trial dropping his volume work and allowing the single to express a little bit more. So we went from a pretty much a three by seven to a four by four. You know, the singles are moving 260 at six, and then he's like 280 at six and a half, like crazy stuff. And then the final week, his range I gave him was 280 to 290. Oh, and you so know what? Fun. He actually took the, the number. Wow. I, I actually forgot. You know, it was funny. I think I programmed that on the plane ride to Adelaide. Nice. So, overall, yeah, he took that higher end. Like, he was being a good boy. Was probably a little bit of an overshoot, to be honest with well, you. You know what? But I think what I wanted to happen worked. I wanted to translate those higher reps into a into a more strength focused, more tried to basically intensify his volume work in the hopes that it would we could achieve that actually over a single block. Because if we did two separate blocks to do it, yeah, that would work. However, I still thought there was benefit to have with higher volume. But we couldn't run that super high volume too close in the comp because we we're really trying to peak his deadlift this block. And so I was like, well, why don't I just make it more like a transitionary period through the entire block? And it seemed to work. His top end's expressed. And what that tells me is coming into, uh, coming into his peak, we've probably got anywhere from a 285 to a 305, like final week, depending on how his meso goes and his fatigue. That's basically kind of what I'm aiming for in terms of a range. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about this is a bit obvious, but just the elephant in the room, the comp standard of the lift. Yeah. Obviously. One hundred percent. Bumper plates. I fully recognize that this lift seems absolutely ridiculous. I fully recognize that he is on bumpers with shoes off and he's in his home territory. Like, yes, this is not a comp standard lift by technicality in terms of the plates. And the lockout was a little bit soft. I can recognize that. That's why I would say it is a bit of an overshoot. However, we can't disregard his absolute insane strength. Like, that's something we just... That is off the table at this point. He used to be a little bit of a meme puller. He would pull... Like, he has come so far. And this block, next this peak, pretty much, we're going to be doing a lot of training sessions on calibrated in unfamiliar gyms. And so, like... I do believe, that's why I said 285 to 305. 285 comp standard, week like final week of a peak, and or 305 comp standard. Who fucking knows what's going to happen, right? Mm. Because, you know, could he peak with a 305 single right now with his current setup that we just watched? I think he could. Could he do that on comp plates? Maybe. We're going to find out. Yeah. So that's my perspective. I can absolutely recognize that this wasn't 100% IPF. But Jesus Christ, if you saw any of his other singles, mm. this block, they were all beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, I pull on bumpers, like it's not that big a deal, but obviously I'm not pulling 290. So the slack that I get out of the bar is not nearly as much. And I, do you know if the bar he was using was a stiff bar? Or that was, was a, that is an IPF stiff, stiff bar, yeah. What so was he, it? Oh, was it Rogue? I, I think it could be a Rogue. Yeah. The I, he know, I know that he goes to that gym specifically, which is O2 performance mm. for the power bar. Okay. That's so, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, even though it was it looked like a deadlift bar, and I was like, "That's, <laughs> this that's got some slack in it." Yeah. Yeah, I just, I mean, two ninety with bumpers just does that to a bar. Yeah, and that's so. fair enough. So we'll see how that translates. Historically, Will doesn't fail at lockout. I mean, not lockout. He does fail at lockout. He doesn't fail off the ground. So we'll see whether that slack will impact his ability to break the floor. Mm -hmm. But but we'll also see whether he can actually lock out because like, just overall range of motion yeah he walks a fine line because he's he's so quad dominant with sumo and he's so upright if you consider his center of mass as normal lifters which we are well i'm sort of not normal because i am more deadlift but for you an example your center of mass deviation is a little bit higher you can handle small margins of error easier than will can because for him he has such thin leverages 
and so much weight where a one millimeter difference changes the moment arm or changes the amount of force required to fix that so much. And so for him, his execution is key. That's actually why I was giving him light singles and building up with volume. I wanted both total practice with the reps. I wanted something which was metabolically equivalent to a set of five or a set of four for a normal lifter. And I wanted to give him a moderately heavy single so that he can execute with weights similar to his opener. He almost always either fails an opener or fails a second attempt in previous, in previous competitions. And so for him, it's like, these are three things I want to work on. And I'm very excited to see if, if we really did address them. Yeah, that's definitely a huge benefit of doing singles year round, in my opinion, is they have the most technical application to them. Think about it like this. If you failed a set of 10 and then you tried coming back 10 minutes later and try to do it again, there's almost zero chance that you're getting that. Mm -hmm. Whereas a single, we've seen countless times on the world stage or just at any comp where people fail a rep and then they come back and they hit it. So there's clearly this level of technique. It's not just, oh, powerlifting is a simple sport, blah, 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 blah. Shut up, weightlifters. <laughs> there's some technique. So you need to practice your top end and you need to practice your technique on these heavy singles. So yeah, that's definitely one benefit, especially for Will. He's so technical. Yeah, absolutely. And a caveat I want to potentially introduce to that as well is sets of 10 at a local, like micro level are very fatiguing. They create a lot of fatigue. They create a lot of stimulus, you know, good or bad. They just, it's a, so much. Like high volume training is a lot. And singles, they don't have that same level of total work. But however, one thing that I still think is very important is that heavy singles, especially on squats and deadlifts, the sheer forces pulling on the joints, on the tendons, is considerably higher. And some lifters can't handle that. And so for my personal application when it comes to singles is that if a lifter is incredibly efficient, if the lifter is incredibly trained, I think heavier singles are probably okay. Especially for things like bench press. Bench press, there's so much, it, like the total damage the muscles take from a heavy single is so low, unless you're like Julius Maddox benching 700 pounds. But when we push heavy singles on, let's say, squats, you know, how the adductor pulls on the pelvis is a lot. It's a lot of force. And that's just one example of like one area. The point is, is that there may be a risk to super heavy singles year round imposing a unique damage to the structures of the body and it's important for many lifters like you said with Ash and Ruska to pull back and so my application with singles and this is something I've been experimenting with more of myself with more my more advanced athletes is singles ranging from like let's say six to seven as opposed to really pushing those higher intensities because a six to seven might be 40 to 35 kilos lower than their competition max and so we're not getting exposed to super high intensity weights which impose that potential risk you know this is a nuance where we no one actually has an answer to it are super duper heavy singles bad for you well maybe they're bad for you in a small set but compared to what a set of five or a four who knows however it's my speculation that maybe does that make sense yeah i mean i'd see it in the way that there's no rep range that is inherently dangerous and there's no sort of or even no technique that is inherently dangerous. It's all about load prescription and volume. If I do a single at eight versus a triple at 10, that's both, that's the same load. That's the same weight on the bar. Is the single more dangerous because it's a single? No. You could even argue that the triple is more quote unquote dangerous. Again, we're using this term dangerous because we don't, we don't actually know what it means. Is it very dangerous? Probably not. For a trained individual with consistent, reliable technique, it's fine. It's yeah, fine. that's but, a great point. Yeah. And if you're pushing singles super hard all the time, it's just as bad as pushing sets of five super hard all the time. Mm -hmm. Because you're pushing to the same exertion regardless. And yeah. I'd even argue that the set of five is more likely to produce some negative outcomes because it's more total work done. A set of five mm -hmm. at 10 is more than a single at 10. And one thing we can say for certain, though, is overexertion at the wrong period of times leads to bad outcomes. 
For example, there was a study that they did on hamstring injuries. Basically, I, I can't remember which school in Brisbane collected heaps of training data on all their sprinters over years. And they looked at work volume. They looked at on a session-to-session basis, on a week-to-week basis, and they had so much data. And these guys, they basically collected all this data, they analyzed it, and they looked at at what points did athletes get injured and what did their training look like. And total volume didn't play an effect. Max velocity didn't really play an effect. The only positive correlation was when there were massive spikes in training volume. Yeah. That's the only time these athletes got injured. So if we try to apply that to powerlifting don't ramp up super fucking hard out of nowhere yeah take phases of training where you ramp up slowly don't go from sets of eight and start peaking use a transition block if you're going to try a more modern approach where you run singles and triples and fives all in the one block slowly push one and slowly decrease the other to avoid massive increases in workload. And I think that is a very... I'm very confident in saying that's a bigger issue than pushing singles. Is that a fair is that a fair argument you'd say? Yeah. Like I said, it's all about application of intensity and volume and even technique. Like, I would go as far as to say that there's no physiological position which is inherently dangerous. It's all about load if you try and do a jefferson curl with 40 kilos is that dangerous no but if you do it with 200 yeah it's going to be dangerous because your back's not strong enough so it's all about what your body is capable of handing it's handling it's not about whether all oh, this position is bad never do it never go anywhere near that avoid spinal flexion which is a myth spinal flexion is great it's pretty cool yeah to be fair though to be the devil's advocate we're not entirely clear if heaps of spinal flexion is bad we're also not sure if you need to be a super flat back the research isn't conclusive but what we do know is that extreme position like as i said it always comes back to the same philosophy is this an extreme position all of a sudden yeah if that's the case then you know what? it's probably bad it's like to be to your point where you say you know what happens if we jefferson curl 200 kilos well that might be bad but what if your jefferson curl max is 300 yeah then exactly. it's not a problem yeah and so, I like to think of at least flexion, there's like a flexion tolerance. What mm. is your tolerance to flexion? You know, if you've just come off a really big injury where you've got aggravation at like the L4, L5, your flexion tolerance is so low. You need to slowly build up. Your body needs to stop sending signals of pain and discomfort and you need to slowly accumulate to the weights over time. Yeah. I, think, I think back to that study with the, the sprinters, it was a... An increase in workload above 10% for longer than four weeks is where they found significant decreases, where they found significant increases in injury rates from memory. So it's not like one session where you max out is the end of the world. It's where you just go fucking crazy for a block. It's like we run like the Bulgarian. Yeah. And then all of a sudden your pec is like saying hello to your shoulder. You know what I mean? Like that's where the problem really comes from. Yeah, definitely. It's all about finding what your body is capable of handling and whether you should be even doing that in the first place is it more beneficial to do more sets maybe not is it more beneficial to do more high quality sets probably you don't need to always just linearly increase volume and intensity until you burn into the ground you can pull back right before you go over the edge it's not like there's this all or nothing approach where if you don't reach these certain intensities then you'll never make progress and that's especially more relevant when we get to these like just heavier lifters or just stronger lifters because the absolute load that they're moving is just more of a toll on their body you know we can talk about relative strength and how oh 200 kilos to them is like 100 kilos to us but they're still a human being like height differences aside mass differences aside they've still got pretty similar builds to us us small boys and that's where the application of minimum effective volume and maximum recoverable volume and maximum adaptive volume come into play and if you, ta- if you understand someone's individual ranges, they can tolerate, you know, X amount of work leads to a result and Y amount of work leads to too much and they cannot progress the following mm. week. Bigger lifters, 
like generally the, the minimum effective volumes and maximum recoverable volumes don't change much as they advance because they get stronger and so their set count decreases and their volume work decreases but when you do sets times reps times weight times range of motion it's relatively equal you know towards as you advance it is your maximum recover volumes do decrease a touch and your tolerance and your minimum effective volume do raise however it's kind of funny how it's almost you sort of just slowly fit within this range because the weights get so heavy and so when you see a lifter like a big high 900 pound squatter they'll do like a, a there's a not one, many of those <laughs> not many of those and i'll tell you what they are not squatting four times a week they're not no. squatting three times a week they're doing one heavy session nine days and the volume looks like a fucking deload for you yeah and that's because well the volume on paper looks that way you forgot to times the weight section you know the volumes are actually pretty equal overall yeah. thought that was an interesting caveat yeah, the only um, only thing I'd say about that is just the metric by which we measure volume. It's not always super reliable to just do sets times set sets times reps times weight because high rep sets have an artificially higher volume by that metric. Instead, I find it's more valuable to just measure the number of total sets within a certain rep range. So, for example, if we just count, if we establish that a set of seven or a set of six is the minimum amount required to produce a certain outcome, then we can just count the number of sets within that range that we have. And that way we reduce the impact of comparing those sets to sets with say three to one, because mm -hmm. the amount of work that you're doing is not the same, even if we, or oh, sorry, it's artificially higher with those high rep sets because we're doing more reps. Just mathematically, we're timesing it by a higher factor. Mm -hmm. It's not just weight. Yeah, absolutely. From a from a programming standpoint, I, th I often find that sets times reps times weight times range of motion isn't very applicable. We need yeah. something more practical like what you said. I think where that total volume expression comes useful is understanding differences between lifters. As we mentioned with the heavyweight squatters, well, they might be doing less sets. According to your equation, the appliable equation, why are they doing less? Well, it's because the fucking weight is so heavy. Yeah, and so it's like, it's funny. We can just we can just as powerlifters we just invent tools and then decide when they're useful and then call it science. I think it's yeah. quite funny. Yeah. This whole thing is just a facade. We're just magicians making shit up and uh, saying it's effective. Yeah, I mean, it all just comes down to try it. Does it work? Yeah, keep doing it. Keep doing what works. That's pretty much all. Pick it up is heavy too. weight. Oh shit, <laughs> heavy weight getting heavier. <laughs> <laughs> so in this section of the podcast, I'm gonna. Quick fire you a statement without any context, kind of like when you get a video from a client and it goes, thoughts? <laughs> and then you go, what is this video? And it goes, just my warm up before my top set. <laughs> Similar fashion, I'm just going to fire you a question. Awesome. And uh, we'll see how it goes. So, should you squat three times a week? Should you squat three times a week is entirely dependent upon one, are you progressing on two times a week or one times a week? And B, do your SRA curves allow for it? A lot of the times we see that people who aren't progressing with their squats sometimes just need more exposure, more practice, more stimulus with the lift in order to progress. Similar with bench press. Everyone loves to say, oh, you, you, your bench is stalled, just bench more. Like, we can apply that same, same thinking to squat, but a lot of the times we don't do it because, oh, it's too fatiguing. Well, not necessarily. Can you handle it? Okay, do more. Just try it. And... A lot of the times we see just a bump in that stimulus will drastically increase performance. Like my athlete, Alex, hit a five kilo PR in a squat and pretty much all we did was just add another squat day to his program. Hmm. So. And it's interesting you say, oh, we can't handle it. That's too fatiguing. Well, it's like the idea of like a, like a, like a bro bodybuilder having one chest day where they do 20 sets. Well, what if you just did two sessions with 10 sets each? And so it's not that we're trying to all of a sudden add all this crazy amount of volume, we're gonna take the current amount of volume, spread it in a, in a way which improves the stimulus per set and improves the freshness per set. If you do, let's say nine sets of squats a week, three on each day, that middle day, those, it's, like, it's like when you do the end of your session and you're doing a tricep extension, you're like, this is fucking boring. I've mentally checked out, I hate my life. <laughs> but what if you just came in the next day and did them? You'd feel really fresh. And so that's where 
squatting three times a week can be really useful is on a per session basis is the current amount of volume you're doing excessive to where the quality is super low at the end if the answer is yes maybe do a third day where you put some of that quote-unquote junk volume and get a higher quality set get more total higher quality sets i think that's where it's useful as well yeah totally and a thing to consider with squatting three times a week if you choose to go with that is that you shouldn't be pushing every day super hard one of them should just be a technique day or an exposure day with a tempo or some kind of variation which limits exertion or load and then you have those days where you're either pushing volume or you're pushing intensity because if you're pushing both on the same day it's just not going to work you're just going to get burnt out and so it's important to recognize that all the different days are going to be different tools it's not just oh add another heavy day it's okay how can i implement this squat day in order to produce the outcome that i want which is either better performance on the primary day or just better performance overall whether that's increase in um, load on the bar increase in set count or just feeling easier better technique these sorts of things it doesn't always have to be the metric that oh is the weight increasing Mm -hmm. and that's a lot a lot of the time where people get caught up but yeah definitely a great tool it's like what problem are we trying to solve more squat exposure for better technique and we want to feel fresher on our main day how are we going to solve it we're going to take what, we're going to add a bunch of volume in the middle of the week, arbitrarily? What, what's that going to do? Well, yeah, you might get more squat exposure, but now your top set, which is like in two days, feels like ass. So that's why it's important that when you do add a squat day, if you decide to do that, that you're very careful with your volume, that potentially use a variation initially that is load capping, as yeah. you were saying, John. Yeah, absolutely. And we do often see that three times a week is often a more advanced frequency or at least it's a more nuanced frequency it's typically seen with more lighter lifters because they can handle these higher workloads because the absolute load that they're moving as we said is not as much as these heavier lifters and so they can handle that extra nuance or that extra complexity within their microcycle it's always important to realize that the more you try to add to a microcycle the more you make it complicated Hmm. i wouldn't give I wouldn't give a three times a week squatter. I wouldn't program three times a week squatting for a lifter who goes and parties on the weekend. Predictability is very important. If a lifter is sucks on their sleep, randomly decides to do some days on others, all the key signs of my predictability is shit. Why would I increase the frequency? That's, it's just not going to work. The lifter is going to show up and they're going to feel like shit on the days or they're going to skip the days. Like what's the point? And so, that's, I think, as well, another reason why advanced lifters tend to, or coaches for advanced lifters tend to bias high-frequency squatting to those lifters is because their training and their lifestyle is way more predictable. Yeah, absolutely. And to go beyond that, even predictability can be better with three times a week squatting because you can see which days are performing better than others. If you can... can blah, blah. Edit that out. <laughs> I'll edit that out, brother. <laughs> if you can consistently recognize that one day is performing really well, that gives you great predictability when it comes to comp time because then you just run the same template. You don't need to change anything. You just adjust certain variables where needed to accommodate for fatigue, and then you just watch it perform. Predictability is very useful in that regard. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So. All right, moving on. Next question, Joel. <laughs> and I think this was your, your favorite one when we were talking prior, is overemphasizing hip engagement, the drawbacks. What does that even mean? I've just said a bunch of random fucking words to you, John. Right. So I think the question you're trying to ask is, what happens when we use our hips too much in our squat? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did not write that question down. I quite literally in my notes put overemphasizing hip engagement in brackets, the drawbacks. Yeah. So what you're trying to say is, <laughs> why do I keep using my hips on my squat? Or should I? And, and deadlift. Deadlift as well? Not using it enough. Not using enough, right, yeah. So, if we look at the squat and we just look at the joint ranges of motion, generally we're going to see that people bias far more knee flexion than they do hip flexion. And that just comes down to the fact that it's a primarily a knee flexion movement. It's primarily 
anterior chain quad dominant movement. Regardless of how you're built, you're going to need to bend your knees to squat. You can't just good morning over and hit death. It's not going to work. People have tried. <laughs> People have and tried. failed. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the times we see this new wave of powerlifters trying to adopt this super low bar, super bent over position where they're trying to get as much out of their hip extensors as they can when they're failing to realize that if you do that, you're just not going to be able to stand up and your overall performance is going to decrease because you're not using the major muscle group, which the squat is, which is your quads and your knee, other knee extensors, your adductors, that sort of thing. If you're constantly using your glutes to get out of your squat, you're missing out on half of your squat. Mm -hmm. It's a balance between the quads, the hips, and the other muscles that stabilize. I think that's interesting you say the balance. Yeah. It's like powerlifters, we just we originally started off doing high bar sissy squats. You know, historically, that's literally how people squatted because yeah. they didn't fucking... That's, I don't know, they just decided... I'm going to fucking bend my knees and shit. Actually, you know the reason why they did that is because they hadn't invented the squat rack. Oh! And so the way they had to get it on their back was doing that Steinborn squat. Have you seen that? That's strong men do. And then that weight is like, if you can pick up weight like that, it's probably going to be too light for you to squat it. So how do you make the squat harder? You sit on your, on your toes mm. and you squat like that. Yeah. And then, so that's how we started. And then we invented squat racks and then mm. we started doing high bar squats. And then powerlifters were like, shit, what if we like put it a little bit down and we got a huge benefit? Yeah. Everyone started getting really strong. And now there's like this wave of everybody going even further, like mm. the quote unquote French low bar. Yeah. Everyone is just maxing out the low bar position and there's diminishing returns. Mm. For example, we talk about the balance. A CC squat does not produce much force. There is instability and imbalance. A French French low bar probably has the same effect. What's happening to the center of gravity? It's pushing you forward by heaps. Yeah. You're getting heaps of heaps of heel pressure, heaps of hips shooting back, and what happens is the body is not in a stable position. Absolutely. If the body is not in a stable position, what does the CNS do? Turns off. Does not produce as much force. Yeah. You cannot squat and get under heavy enough weights if you're not stable. Yeah. And there's like this balancing act, and I, I my bias is that you should probably stop maxing out the hip range of motion and you should probably just focus on learning how to squat with balance and coordination and leveraging your quads. Yeah, it almost becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy where you sort of just internalize this idea of, oh, I'm a hip dominant squatter. I've got to use my hips, 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 hips. That old West Side sort of Mark Ripito sort of thinking. Oh, yeah. Hip drive. Hip drive. <laughs> a low bar squat. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it this way, if you're creating such a dynamic between a high bar squat and a low bar squat where it's that much of a shift between the anterior and posterior chain, all you've done is move the bar down a few inches. Does that few inches in position change drastically um, alter the muscle recruitment? Not really. We know that leverage is a huge thing and that even a small change can allow us to get more out of that position and then we can produce more force. But biomechanically your hips and your knees are still going to be prime movers and your knees need to flex you need forward knee travel and a lot of the times we just aren't seeing that nowadays we are not it's like oh my hips are really strong in the deadlift maybe i'm going to try and create the exact same joint angles in the squat yeah are you forgetting that the hamstrings turn off in the squat mm. like the knee flexors and hip extensors two actions happening at the same time during a squat, your hamstrings turn off. The reason why we're hinging in a deadlift is because the hips have such a powerful role in producing force. You're using your hamstrings and your glutes as your primary hip extensors. Mm. You don't do that in the squat. You're standing up and down. Your hamstrings turn off. And so it is, it is like quite literally, if someone just said, hey Ashton, I'm going to steal your quads. I'll give them back to you in a little bit. Don't worry. Now do a squat. It's not going to work. What's going to, what's going to fucking happen? Yeah. Like, I actually don't know. <laughs> I mean, I have an idea. I'm not going to squat. It's, it's just not going to happen. Like, yeah. in the leg press, you can, like, sort of, like, use your glutes and, like, a, uh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you don't really need quads for a leg press. But this is a barbell movement in a free-moving position where gravity is pushing down. You need quads. Yeah. That's reality. Yeah. And the same thing goes for the deadlift, like you were saying. If you try and bias far too much 
anterior chain, far too much quad, you're going to end up with your center of mass behind the barbell, your hips are going to shoot up, knees are going to come in. Your body will try and reorganize yourself into the strongest position. And even though from a 2D skeleton, you might biomechanically have the strongest leverage or the least range of motion, your body's not able to produce force in that position. It's important to remember the deadlift is inherently a hip extension movement and the squat is inherently a knee flexion movement. Mm -hmm. One is inherently anterior chain and one is inherently posterior chain. And so we can create more balances between those, um, what's the word? Between those force producing positions. We, sorry, we can create more balance between those biases between the lifts, but inherently it's going to favor one or the other. Of course, that's why they are two separate movements. And it's interesting you mentioned about the deadlift being in a two-dimensional plane. A lot of people, they think, okay, the hip moment arm decreases in the deadlift when you open up your legs and pull sumo. Yeah. But they fail to account for, because if you look at a 2D plane, the length of the moment arm from the bar to the hip in a 2D plane, so bar, hip, yeah. it's longer. But when you open your legs, it shortens. What they're forgetting about is the other plane where it increases. So the hip moment arm, even though it's sumo, even though there's more quad, approximately three times the torque off the floor, it's still predominantly hip extension movement. Yeah. And we can see that with EMG activation with these studies. We can see that although the um, quad engagement increases, the hip engagement is the same. So it's not that we've suddenly switched from hip to quad. It's that we've gone from hip to hip and quad. So... If you're constantly trying to optimize for one or play to your strengths, stop. <laughs> just stop. <laughs> just stop, bro. Just stop. <laughs> just get stronger. Just bring your legs closer. <laughs> <laughs> just stop doing that. Stop trying to be, um, what's his name? Will Evans. Will Evans. Mr. Stop Dennis trying to be specialist. him. And just... You ain't him. <laughs> you ain't not him. You are not him. He is not him. And like just... a really good way to tell as well if you're over queuing, let's say quad on the sumo deadlift is the moment you start the lift your hips shoot up what does that tell us that tells us the body is reorganizing itself to produce the most force if you constantly drive heaps of external rotation push off the floor with your quads okay you'll produce force but the moment your hips shoot back you produce way more force yeah and so a more hinged position leveraging your hips in a better stronger spot is your movement. That's how you do it. And so it's really valuable to film yourself and assess what's happening with your form. Because sometimes you don't even notice it. Your hips just shoot back and all of a sudden the weight goes up. But yeah. if you can recognize that and go, oh, that happened. Okay, now I'm going to try and start with my hips there. And what's that all of a sudden? Like you pull the slack better and the weight goes up? Yeah. And sometimes it's just about looking what happens to your form when you reach those top end intensities. If your back is rounding with your 1RM deadlift, maybe just embrace a little bit more spinal neutrality. Maybe embrace a little bit more flexion. Stop trying to be so extended and stop fear-mongering flexion, as we said earlier. It's not bad to just go into those positions that your body wants to be in. It's about producing the most force. That's the aim of the game. It's not about adhering to some arbitrary form because starting strength said it was good. Or, some, or one of your favorite lifters says it's good. One of the things that makes Will so good at deadlifts is that his arms are so long, which reduces the moment arms of everything. It's kind of funny. Longer the arms, the less of the arms. It's kind of a bit of a pun. Yeah, and that was terrible. It was fucking terrible. Okay, I'll be honest. And the second part that makes him really good is his torso is so short. And what happens is, when you deadlift, there is a moment arm on your lower back. And... Oftentimes, to break the floor, that moment arm has to decrease to be round. Yeah. But because his moment arm of the back is so low, his hips are able to produce way more force because they're not limited by the moment arm of the lower back. And so he can hit heavier weights with less rounding and use his quads more and use his hips more. So, like, if you're a longer torso lifter, why are you driving so much hip? Like, sometimes you've just got to get stronger. There's no optimizing because someone has cool form. Like, yeah, Will's got insane insane leverages. You, they're his leverages. Like, you can't beat physics. Stop yeah. copying people. Yeah, there's very few people who, although it's pushed heavily, 
you just see it all over the place. There's very few people who can actually pull efficiently and produce force in that super wide, super external sumo position. It's just not conducive of, <laughs> of, strong, of a strong position. You don't see any other athlete in that position. Like, if we think about it, we're just trying to produce force. That's what athletics is, or that's what just human sport is. We're trying to produce force. Obviously, there's some variance, but we can just make generalizations about what positions are going to be indicative of our strongest position. And you've got to individualize, but you've also got to look at, okay, biomechanically, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, you shouldn't be pulling that wide, and you should bring your toes in a little bit more. Absolutely. Deadlift specialists stand really wide for a very particular reason. They are deadlift specialists. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm guilty. I produce a lot of force when I'm pushing the floor out. I'm externally rotating and I'm really setting up a good position. But a lot of lifters, they just can't pull like me or like Will. Yeah. And it's interesting enough. It's, it's always the sub-junior 16-year-olds with bendy bars, bumper plates, and straps. I'm sorry, but like you're basically faking Will's form. Yeah. Like you're artificially increasing the length of your arms. So it makes sense that like some dumb gym pool, these kids naturally gravitate to that. Yeah. And um, one thing about Will's technique is he's got really great leverage off the ground, but then as soon as he locks his knees, he has to fight to lock out. And we were discussing this earlier about the fact that in that super external position, our glutes are pre-contracted. And so once we lock out our knees, they're not in a strong position to produce force in order to lock out. And so I'd say that's a large contributor to the fact that Will fails at lockout all the time. It's not because you use the wrong socks, Will. I'm sorry. It's not the socks. I'm sorry. Oh, look. I'm I mean, sorry. <laughs> on comp day, if you're missing your seconds, I'll... Okay, we'll mate, it's the socks. It's the socks. We'll yeah. take the same weight, mate. It'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. On comp, it's all about placebo. But yeah, it's interesting you say that. It's like, it's like Will needs exponentially more glute than everybody else. Because... That because based on the 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 force tension curve of the glutes and the position he's in, top end glute is not very strong in general. Yeah. Like lockout on glute is not very strong, and he needs so much more of it. So things like conventional and heavy RDLs and hip thrusts are very useful for him. Yeah, and I'd even go as far as to say that it, there might come a point where you just have to consider, for the sake of his consistency, switching to a more neutral toe position or a slightly narrower stance so that he can actually lock out because mm. we can have these crazy gym pulls and these crazy PRs in training, but why are we training? To perform on comp. Mm -hmm. And if Will keeps going one for three on pulls, then <laughs> I'm sorry, but something's got to change. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that. We did make some form adjustments. Will discovered on his own accord to go a little bit more of a neutral and a little bit closer stance. And yeah. his execution's paid off. So, theory we just had, what actually happened, those two just met. They're just like, mm, they just started kissing. <laughs> so, just like us in a second. Just like us in a second, <laughs> man. Shit, but we got to turn this off right yeah, now, man. That's Shit. off camera. You got to pay for that. <laughs> Sorry, our OnlyFans. Yeah. But, yeah. Anyway, I thought that was it. I was trying to think of like a pun with OnlyFans and powerlifting. Only power. That was... Oh. Edit that out. I'm gonna, no, I'm keeping that shit. Don't Everyone needs to know that. how embarrassing that yeah, was, brother. We just lost views because of that. But I mean, it's the end of the video. That's fine. Yeah. So.